So today we're going to talk about the surgical repercussions of hypertension. So this is actually a picture of me operating. Um, I'm the hands on the right side of the screen. We all in the OR learn how to recognize each other by our hands and just our eyes because we have hats and masks on. And this is a uh, transplant on a two-year-old up in Dallas. So. We're going to talk about four different areas today um, of things that hypertension affect in heart disease. But since I'm a surgeon, I like talking about anatomy and physiology. I want to know what's going on in that heart of yours and what the different things like hypertension actually do to the heart and cause things to go bad. So a little crash course in medical school for all of you. We're going to have our coronary and our cardiac anatomy to start everything off. So if you're looking at someone's heart, if you're looking at my heart, it's facing that direction like it is on the screen. So you have two sides of your heart. There's a right side and there's a left side. The right side is in charge of getting all the old blood back from your body and it does that with those blue veins on the side called the vena cava. There's a superior one which means top, so it's coming back from your head and your arms. And there's an inferior one meaning bottom and that's coming up from the bottom half of your body. So that empties blood into a filling chamber called the atrium. So there's the right atrium where that all collects. It fills up just like an atrium in a big fancy building. That is where all the people come in, fills up there, and then it moves to the next part. The next part's called the squeezing chamber called the ventricle, okay? So you can see in the picture where everything's kind of cut away, how it looks like a thick muscle, all right? So the ventricle's in charge of taking that blood that fills up and squeezing it out the body. And it does that by pumping it into the arteries to go out to your body. On the right side of the heart, it goes to the pulmonary artery, meaning it's gonna take that old blood to your lungs to get reoxygenated, and then it comes back in the left side and does the same thing over again. So it comes in that left atrium, goes into that left ventricle, and then pumps out the big blood vessel of your body called the aorta, okay? And that's that big pink one coming right out the top. So if we're talking about how blood flows, that's kind of the map of where it goes. When we have blue blood in any of the pictures you see of hearts, that's because when blood doesn't have oxygen in it anymore, it gets really dark, but then when you add the oxygen back in, it turns bright red, and it really does look like that. We see that all the time in surgery with the heart-lung machine, where we take the old blood out, pump it through our machine, and put oxygen in it, and it comes back fire engine red. So there's our example. Now when the heart's beating, if you think of a heartbeat, you hear that bump, 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 right? So we have our heart being bump, bump. The first one we're hearing is our atrium squeezing blood into that ventricle, and the second one is the ventricle squeezing it out to the body. When we're talking about the heart squeezing, that's how we get our blood pressure numbers. Dr. Pachika talked about that systolic and diastolic, or that top number and bottom number, which basically, what is that? So the top number is the amount of pressure that's in that aorta when the heart's squeezing. The bottom number is the pressure still sitting in that aorta when the heart's relaxed and filling back up. So the way I describe that is if you're blowing up a balloon and you blow and you have that balloon expanding, you have that pressure filling up the balloon and you can feel it against your lungs, right? There's still, when you're done blowing, when you're taking your new deep breath again, there's still pressure in that balloon. It stays inflated. It's not as high because you're not actively blowing it in, but there's still some sitting in there, okay? So that's what we're seeing on that top number and bottom number. When you have hypertension, Dr. Pachika was talking about how you have the blood vessels where they start getting thicker and harder, where they don't, they're not nice and stretchy like a balloon would be. So think of those little balloons that are really thick. Think of how hard it is to blow up that balloon. That's how the extra work that's going on and the extra pressure, if that makes sense. We also have some heart valves inside the heart, and they're in charge of making sure blood only moves forward throughout the heart. Okay, it's like a turnstile at a train station. It's a one-way valve, so when it leaves one chamber, it's not supposed to go backwards back into the other chamber. So that's what your heart valves do, okay? So the first thing we're gonna talk about is called AFib, which is one of my specialties that I like to deal with, and I'm sure you've all heard of AFib. It's a very common disease. So it's a shortened term for atrial fibrillation, and it's basically a malfunction in the electrical system of the heart. Normally when we have that bump, 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 it comes from your heart's pacemaker. 
It starts up top in that top of that atrium in an area called the sinus node, and it sends a signal out like a wave until it reaches something called the AV node that catapults it through that ventricle. Okay, so everything's nice and coordinated. It goes together. And that's what we're looking at when we see those EKGs that we hook you up to. We can see all the little shape of it shows us exactly where that electric electrical signal is going. So this is an example of normal that we like. When you have atrial fibrillation, there's extra signals that generate in your heart for a lot of reasons. AFib is a disease that's related to age. About 9% of people over the age of 65 develop AFib. And in general, in the past, most doctors and patients and pretty much everyone has thought, mm, well, they just have a little bit of AFib, we'll go on our medicine and just have to deal with it. But in recent years, very recent years, we're finding out this is a much bigger problem than we've noted in the past. So AFib is actually related to about 20% of strokes in the United States. It can also cause heart failure. So when you have that AFib, the signal, instead of just going from that point A to point B, there's extra signals that can develop anywhere inside that atrium. So they spin around in the atrium, and they look like little tornadoes going around. So every time they pass that AV node, it triggers it to fire. So instead of our bump, 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 we're going to have that, but then bump, 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 all over the place. All right, so that makes it, so instead of having that nice coordinated squeeze of your heart, it just wiggles on that atrial chamber on the top. And that's what fibrillation means, just wiggling. So when patients have that issue, they can develop symptoms or it can be silent. So some of the symptoms, especially when that heartbeat starts going really quickly, you can have a racing heart, palpitations. It can feel like it's pounding out of your chest. It can make people develop shortness of breath, dizziness, or chest pain. And this all comes from the loss of what we call an atrial kick. So normally that atrium is helping to squeeze blood into that ventricle, so it's very efficient to squeeze it out the next part. If you don't have the atrium squeezing, just like it's wiggling, then we rely kind of on gravity for that blood to get through. So the way I describe that, if you're thinking of a waitress at the end of her shift and she's filling up her ketchup bottles, if she just lines them all up and lets gravity try to pull that ketchup down, it's going to take forever and it's not very efficient. If she has squeeze bottles, she can fill those ketchup bottles up quickly and be ready for her next shift. So that's exactly what the heart's doing. If, you're, if you don't have that atrium to help squeeze and fill that ventricle, it's very inefficient for the heart and you can feel it. And while that blood is sitting there in the atrium and not emptying all the way as it's wiggling, it can just um, have what we call stasis. So meaning the blood's pooling somewhere in your heart. Now when you hear about AFib, I'm sure you have all seen commercials or you may have it yourself or know people that have it. All the commercials aren't about this heartbeat. They're all about strokes, right? So the reason AFib is such a big problem is because as that blood is sitting there, it can form clots inside the heart. So think of any time blood's not moving. If you get a scrape on your arm and that blood's just sitting on the surface, you're going to get a scab. Same thing happens in your heart. If it's not squeezing and moving out of that chamber, you're going to form a clot in there. And as that happens, the clot can shoot out and go up to your brain and cause a stroke. It gets clogged, okay? The reason I'm bringing this up in a hypertension talk is because high blood pressure makes you more likely to form clots when you have AFib than someone who doesn't have high blood pressure. High blood pressure also makes you more likely to have a bleeding problem when you go on your blood thinners for AFib. So that's one area in AFib, unlike age or gender or things like that, that we can work on to help lower your risk of having complications. So the things we do um, that also we look at that don't get as much press as a stroke, you can actually develop heart failure. So as that blood's not emptying from the atrium, it's stretching up more and more time because you know each heartbeat leaves a little bit of blood behind and that heart stretches out. That can also cause the valves to stretch out so they don't meet anymore. It's no longer a one-way valve and it starts leaking, which makes the problem worse and worse. So things we do to help this. We try to restore a normal heartbeat and we do that with different medications. I'm sure some of you have heard of amiodarone. I'm sure some of you have also heard of something like beta blockers, um, which beta blockers are used to control it, but they don't get you back to a regular rhythm. They try to control the symptoms. 
Um, another way we try to get you back to a regular rhythm is shocking the heart. So I tell patients that the heart's job is to beat. That's what it wants to do. That your electrical system, your pacemaker, its only job is to go, and it's controlled without your brain. Uh, the way we really see this in surgery, on TV you always see when we're restarting the heart after surgery, that we shock it back to life. It's actually not the case at all. What we do in surgery is just give blood supply back to it, and the heart will start itself. Even when we do heart transplants, we'll have an, a heart that's been sitting in the cooler for five or six hours on ice. As soon as we put it in the patient and give blood supply back, it starts itself right up. Even more interesting, when we take that old bad heart out and it's sitting on the back table, it'll still keep beating by itself on the back table even though it's not attached to a person at all. So that's related to how we shock the heart. When we shock it, it restarts it. It's like resetting your alarm clock and that natural rhythm can take over again. Now AFib itself can be very, very tricky. Um, there are a lot of times where it just keeps coming back. These treatments may not work long term. And so that's when we get into my world of things that are more aggressive. So I work closely with the electrophysiologist doctors. They're called EPs. They're a specialized type of cardiology that can go in and they can do what's called an ablation. So that's where they go in the cath lab, put a catheter in the groin, and they can go up and try to find where one of these signals has been generating. And they go in and they burn it or they freeze it and it kills that little area of the heart and turns it into scar. So since it's scar, it can't generate that new signal. It's not an electrical impulse like a nerve and it's not a muscle like um, where it can squeeze, okay? So this works really well for patients who have AFib on and off and they're having symptoms, the medicines aren't controlling it, or sometimes you just can't tolerate your medicines. Some of those medicines can have some pretty rough side effects. So that's who would be a candidate for the ablation. When you're having an open heart surgery, which is what I do, say so you're going in for a bypass or a valve surgery, and you have AFib, there's a different type of ablation I can do that's much more extensive. So in the past couple of decades, we've been able to find all the different places where these signals can come from, and instead of trying to find one and burn it, I can do all the places where we've studied and know, and I can burn all those areas at the same time. So instead of a little catheter where I go in and do a dotted line, I use special clamps that can burn a whole line and, but your heart is stopped on the heart-lung machine, which is why I have the ability to do that. So it's very invasive, but it's if you're already going for an open heart surgery. So I either burn or freeze, and I set up what's called a maze. So all those dark pink lines, and then there's a picture on the other side, are examples of where I draw my burn lines, and it creates a maze so that signal from A to B can run through my maze and get where it needs to go, and all those other signals swirling around will run into a wall and stop, okay? So it's an excellent surgery. It cures about 85% of AFib. The downside is you have to have open heart surgery to do that, and right now, only about 3% of people with AFib also need open heart surgery. So one of the, the procedures that we're actually hoping to have started here in the next couple of months is called a hybrid maze. And that is where the EP doctor and I both work together to do the exact same surgery that has that very high success rate, but doing it without having to open your chest and without having to go on the heart-lung machine and stop your heart. So the way I do that is using a scope on each side and I can burn almost all those lines in my maze and then within the next um, six to uh, 12 weeks, the EP doctor goes back in from the inside with the catheter and he can finish all of the areas and check and make sure no signals are leaking through and fix it at that time. So we're very excited because the patients who have very pesky AFib that keeps coming back, their success rate with the ablation with just in the EP lab is only about 30%. And the success of the hybrid, if we do it together, is reporting to be about 90% cure of AFib, most of which can get off of their medicines as well. 
The other thing we can do in surgery is take off the area on the back of the heart called the left atrial appendage. It looks like a little finger sitting on the back of the heart and that's where 95% of, of those blood clots form. It's just an area where blood can get in and it's so narrow it can't get out very easily. So when I'm in surgery, I put that special white clip over it and it works just like clamping off a baby's umbilical cord. It smushes it off and then over time it just shrivels up and falls off and you don't have to worry as much about clots forming from AFib and it really lowers that stroke risk. The next thing that hypertension can really affect are aneurysms. I'm sure you have all heard about this and Dr. Pachika discussed a little bit related to your brain, but for a heart surgeon, we look at your aorta. So your aorta, looking back at anatomy of course, because it's my favorite, your aorta looks like a giant candy cane sitting in your chest and there's different parts we look at. So the first part called the aortic root comes right out of your heart and that's where your aortic valve is and your coronary arteries which are giving your blood supply to the heart muscle. The next part is called the ascending aorta. It turns to the aortic arch. That's where the blood vessels going to your brain come off. And then finally it turns and goes all the way down your chest in the descending aorta, then down to your abdomen where you get your, all the rest of your arteries for your kidneys, your bowels, your legs, everything else. Now when you have an aneurysm, it means it's expanded or dilated up in an area that's abnormal. So that aorta gets bigger, but as it's getting bigger, it thins out that wall. Normally an aorta has a nice thick wall that's made out of muscle, so it's very strong. Back to our balloon analogy, if you're blowing up with your high blood pressure and that balloon has a weak area, it forms that little bubble on the side. I'm sure you've all seen that or in a, in a tire that's having issues. So as that gets bigger and bigger, it gets weaker and weaker and then we run into the risk of complications. In the aorta, you can have this in different spots and the, depending on where in your aorta that aneurysm is located decides what kind of treatment you need. So the one that you're gonna see a heart surgeon for is the ascending aorta or the arch and then for the descending or down into the abdomen, that's where you see a vascular surgeon. You can also have something called an aortic dissection. I don't know if you've all heard of that before, but that's where the inner lining of the aorta wall tears. Like I said before, it was the aorta has a muscle wall, and if you were to look down the middle of it, it kind of looks like a paper towel roll. So you have the cardboard in the middle, and that's where the blood's supposed to flow, and then you have all the paper towel layers, and that's our muscle. And if that cardboard tears, and that blood can seep out into the layers of the paper towel, that's what a dissection would be. So obviously the paper towel is not nearly as strong as that cardboard, so you can run the risk of it eventually rupturing, or if blood is going out there and into the wall, that means it's not getting to where it needs to be, like your brain or your kidneys and everything like that. Okay, so that's why dissections can be so dangerous. So what causes an aneurysm and also a dissection, there can be a lot of things and hypertension is a big part of that. When you're adding high pressure every single heartbeat into that aorta, it's gonna affect those weak areas more and make them weaker and weaker and weaker. People who have these aneurysms naturally have something wrong with the strength of their blood vessels. So it can be a connective tissue disease. People who have a congenital malformation of their valve called a bicuspid aortic valve is very common. About one in 50 people have it. And it just means it's shaped differently. Usually you'll never notice unless we're looking for it. But we found that that's related to aneurysms as well. It can come from trauma, especially high falls. Um, or really bad car wrecks. It can come from infection. Oddly enough, the infection that this is related to is syphilis. And it can also be idiopathic, which is the medical word for we don't know what caused it. So what does it cause? It causes a big emergency. John Ritter, is, this is what he passed away from, um, if you're familiar with his whole story. Um, but what do we do to help? So if we're lucky enough to find that your aorta is starting to get big on a CAT scan we just happened to get, then we monitor it very closely. We know it doesn't run the risk of rupturing or tearing until it gets to a certain size. Sometimes if we can control your blood pressure and control some other things, it never reaches that size. So we just keep a close eye so you don't need a very big surgery unless you know, we're running a higher risk. 
The next thing is to know the symptoms. So people who have sudden chest pain, especially if it goes through to their back, feels like a very severe tearing, things like that. Sometimes people can also have stroke symptoms as it tears up into their carotid arteries. Those are all symptoms of needing to go to the hospital immediately. When I say it's an emergency, um, I would say it's probably the biggest emergency heart surgeons see, even bigger than heart attacks. So the death rate from an aortic dissection is 90% if we don't treat it. So it's still a very high risk even if we can get you to the OR in time, but this is one of the ones where we're running to surgery to get it taken care of as quickly as we can. Now the surgery itself depends on the type of aneurysm you have. Like I was talking about earlier, if you see a cardiac surgeon, it's because it's in that ascending or in the arch, and we have to go in and take that whole part out and replace it with a graft. So a man-made tube we sew back in place. Depending on how much of that aorta is involved, sometimes we have to take off your coronary arteries and put them back in. Sometimes we have to give you a new heart valve at the same time. So you can imagine this is a very big surgery, um, and that's why we try to catch it before it turns into a complication. So it's not a big surgery also under an emergency. Now, if you're lucky enough to have it in the descending part instead of the ascending, it actually, most of the time, does not even need a surgery. We can just control our blood pressure, and that's all it is. It just needs to be monitored. If it does get big enough where it's at risk, the vascular surgeons have some new technology where they can go in your groin and put a stent in the area so blood doesn't even flow into the aneurysm. It just goes down through the middle of our stent instead. So that is a very nice option compared to the old-fashioned surgery we used to have for aortas. But still, if it's that ascending part, then that means you're coming to see me for a big emergency surgery, okay? The next thing probably that you're all the most familiar with will be heart attacks. And Dr. Pachika discussed how high blood pressure is related to our coronary vessels. So back to anatomy, of course. This is a picture of our coronary anatomy. So coronary just means it's the arteries that go to the heart muscle itself, so it gives it blood supply, so it can do its squeezing. Now, if you're looking at the heart, it's basically in real life shaped kind of like a pyramid. There's a front, there's a back, and there's a side, and then there's the big base on the bottom. On the side, that's where our filling chambers are, the atria, so we don't worry about that area all too much. When we're talking about the big muscle areas, we have three spots we look at. There's the bottom, the front, and the back. And that's where our coronary arteries are distributed. So there's a right coronary artery that runs along the side and then covers that whole bottom of the heart. You have a left coronary artery that's called the left main, and it comes out and then splits off right away into two areas. One goes to the front and one wraps around the back. Now when you have your high blood pressure and your high cholesterol, that's when we run risks of having our coronary arteries starting to narrow down and block off. That's our risk of heart attacks right there. So you can see our pictures here. The one on the left is looking at the artery from the side, and the one on the right is looking at it right down the barrel like it was a pipe you cut in half and looked in. Over time, if you have high blood pressure, that high pressure is squeezing down those little tiny arteries every single heartbeat and it causes pressure on the wall. Your body is pretty amazing and it tries to protect itself from that high pressure so it starts building up a plaque and hardening and that keeps it safe from getting that aneurysm, from rupturing, but over time it started, starts causing narrowing. Especially if you have high cholesterol, that plaque fills up with something that's kind of like a toothpaste consistency, and it can start narrowing down. Now when it starts narrowing, most of the time that's when we start thinking of patients who are getting chest pain. So that heart's working hard, and then as you start working harder, it needs more oxygen, right? Just like any exercise you're doing, you're gonna start breathing harder to get oxygen and blood moving around your body. Well, if it's narrowed down, we have a little bit of a bottleneck and it can't get through to give that muscle more oxygen, so you're gonna start feeling, heart, start feeling chest pain. Um, you know, the way I describe that is if you're sprinting and you feel that burn in your legs, that's because that muscle isn't getting enough oxygen. Same thing in your heart. If it's working and it's doing its little exercise like a sprint and you start feeling chest pain, that's like the burn in your muscle, okay? So as that gets worse and worse, narrower and narrower, it doesn't take as much activity for you to still get that pain, all the way down to the point of even sitting around doing nothing, you can start getting chest pain. 
when we start talking about an actual heart attack, that's when we talk about that plaque rupturing, which we're seeing in the bottom picture there. So the plaque can become unstable, can break open, and that toothpaste inside can squeeze out and completely block off the artery. So when that happens, blood can't get through at all, and the area of the heart that that branch of the artery supplies will actually die if we don't get blood supply back to it quick enough, okay? The severity of your heart attack depends on where in the artery the blockage is. If it's way out there at the tip and it only gets a small amount of muscle, that may be a silent heart attack. You don't even have any symptoms. But if it's way up at the top at that left main before it branches into our two main arteries on the front and the back, that's the one we call the widow maker because if that blocks off, it takes out that entire left ventricle that squeezes blood out to your heart, okay? So, everyone knows the symptoms of a heart attack, right? We need to look for the chest pain under your breastbone, can radiate to your shoulder, your jaw, your arm, people get sweaty, they have nausea and vomiting, they call, the, call for the, the uh, paramedics to come help them. One message we are working very strongly to get out, when they were doing all the studies on patients who come in with heart attacks, all of these studies in the past were done on men. So, we are finding out now that women can also present like that, but more commonly present in different ways, where they just feel like it's a pressure, they feel like there's a bubble sitting in their chest, they sometimes only have back pain, neck pain, hand and arm pain, nothing in their chest whatsoever. Sometimes it's just shortness of breath, where they're making their bed and all of a sudden they have to take a break, where normally they can do all of their housework with no trouble. Sometimes it's headache, fatigue, feeling sick to your stomach, or dizziness. Um, all of these things are pretty vague symptoms, and women being women, we tend to think it'll just get better. I just need to keep an eye on it. So women in general are seeking medical attention for heart disease much later than men are, and we're having worse outcomes because of it. So the rule of thumb, if you're having these symptoms, and you sit down and rest, and it doesn't go away after about five minutes, then you need to give a call to your doctor or to the, the uh, um, paramedics to get checked out. So the things we do to help, of course, prevention, uh, controlling blood pressure and controlling your cholesterol, among other things. One nice service ETMC has started um, is something called My Heart First, and this is a service where you pay $149 out of pocket so you don't have to deal with the mess of insurance, and you get this whole list of tests. So they do a cholesterol panel, your EKG, they do studies on your carotids to make sure you're not at a stroke risk with blockages. They check your circulation to your legs. They check for aneurysms. And then they also go in and check a CAT scan of your chest to look at your coronary calcium score to see if you're at a high risk of having blockages in there. The big bonus to that is it also checks everything in your chest. So we've diagnosed some lung cancers very early, among other things. So it's a very good service that ETMC has started putting on. You just have to call that number on the bottom of the screen there and they'll set you up for an appointment and everything's done in one day and you get your results and they send them out to your doctor. The next thing we can do, of course, is our medications to prevent our heart disease. We have our statins, which um, are our anti-cholesterol medicines, but we've also found out probably a more important um, effect of them is their um, anti-inflammatory drugs specific to your coronary arteries. So if you have little plaques that have already formed in there, it helps stabilize them so the ones you have don't break open and cause a heart attack. The other thing that helps a lot is aspirin. I'm sure you all have seen, you know, Bayer helped stop my heart attack. When that plaque can break open, your blood cells come and form a clot and aspirin helps prevent the blood cells from sticking together so that clot can't form. So that gives you enough time to let a little trickle of blood through there to give blood supply to your heart. So the things we do otherwise is go to the cath lab where they can put a stent in, where they go through the middle of that blockage and open it up, or you can end up going for open heart surgery for a bypass. The way we decide about this is if you have one area of blockage of those three, the front, the back, and the bottom, one area definitely needs a stent. Two areas needs, can get stents unless you're diabetic. Then it's shown to be better long term if you have open heart surgery with a bypass. And if you have all three areas of blockages, then the studies are showing it's better to have open heart surgery. 
So when I do my bypass, I move an artery off of your ribs, I take a vein out of your leg with a special scope, and I go around the blockages. So you can see just a small picture there of I cut, a, cut the artery open on the heart, and it looks kind of like the vein on the top of your hand. And I can sew the new vein or artery to that and then hook it up so there's a blood supply going in. So bypass, when we discuss if it's a double, triple, quadruple, it's how many areas of the heart we're sewing to. And then the last thing, which I'll finish up here quickly, is heart failure. That's another complication that basically all roads, all these things can lead to heart failure, and high blood pressure itself can lead to heart failure. So that's basically over time, the inefficient AFib, the not enough blood supply to the heart, the high blood pressure where the heart's working against it, over time it basically makes the heart muscle too tired. And the heart's trying to compensate for it, it starts putting scar tissue down between the muscle fibers as it's all stretching out and getting sicker and sicker. And eventually you can't pump blood out to your organs as well as you once did. So high blood pressure can cause this, a coronary disease, valve disease, sometimes people who are born with heart defects, some viruses can cause it, and some forms of chemotherapy can cause it. So you can have fluid back up on your lungs. You can have not enough blood supply get down to your bowels and get pain when you eat. You can have poor circulation to your legs, or you can have your legs swell up because fluids start backing up. The heart's not pumping it forward well. You can have some neuro changes where you feel confused, fatigued, just not quite yourself. You can have your liver start to have problems. People can actually get cirrhosis from heart disease. And you can have trouble with your kidneys. So we try to reverse what we can. If you need a bypass, we give you the bypass. If you need a valve, we give you the valve. And we give you different medications to try to prevent the progression. It gets to the point where you may need a surgeon. If all of that has failed and you have very low heart function, around 20% or less, we now have some heart pumps we can put in that do the job for you. So these are some examples of the heart pumps. And this is what I was putting in at the beginning of my training, and they're now getting smaller and smaller and smaller to where they're about the size of a bike bell that we can use. And the future generations of them um, are getting smaller to about the size of a golf ball. They're even saying that you won't have to have an electricity plug to it, a battery, that you'll be able to charge with a charger in your mattress using magnets. So that's pretty cool. And the last thing we need to talk about if that heart pump fails or if you're not a candidate, that's when we're talking about needing a heart transplant. So about 5 million patients a year in the United States have heart failure, and this is the fastest growing population of heart disease in the United States. About 400 to 600,000 people per year get heart failure. Um, when we're talking about our transplants, uh, just over 3,000 patients every single year need a transplant, but there's only about 2,000 donors a year. And of all the donors that could, you know, of every 2,000 donors that could potentially give their organs, should someone need it, only about seven do. So we have a vast, um, shortage for heart transplants in our country for some a disease that's getting worse and worse. So that's my little plug. If you're not an organ donor, then to donate life. And that is it. So we'll talk about that's some of the, this is a picture of a rat heart. This is some of the, um, some of the research going on where they can take the cells out of the rat heart and turn it into cartilage instead and then inject some stem cells and they're starting to beat on their own. They regrow their own heart for patients who are waiting on the transplant list. So that hopefully is going to take care of that donor shortage in the future and because it's built out of the patient's own cells, they won't have rejection problems as well. So that's actually being done, I believe, down at Texas Heart in Houston. So very impressive. All right, so I think that's done for both of us, so we can take...